City TV Vancouver is a proud supporter of Pride. Happening tonight in Vancouver. An apology from the Archdiocese of Vancouver nearly one week after news the remains of 215 Indigenous children were discovered on the grounds of a former residential school in Kamloops. Coming up, what the local Catholic leader has to say and what he's pledging to do. Remember the children. That's what's coming out of the ceremony here in Vancouver as those in the community remember the 215 children who were found at a former residential school in Kamloops. A second threatening incident at a BC campsite. Or there's a very small number of bad apples that we don't want to ruin it for the rest of us and so we just need some more enforcement. And remember these conflicts are very rare. This is City News Everywhere. The church was unquestionably wrong. That's just part of the online apology released by the Archdiocese of Vancouver Wednesday afternoon. Nearly one week after the world learned the remains of 215 Indigenous children were found on the grounds of a former residential school in Kamloops. Archbishop J. Michael Miller is offering condolences from the Catholic Church following last week's grisly discovery. In a 14-part Twitter thread posted six days after the announcement of the discovery, Miller says in light of the heartbreaking disclosure of the remains of 215 children at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, I am writing to express my deep apology and profound condolences to the families and communities that have been devastated by this horrific news. He goes on to say if words of apology for such unspeakable deeds are to bring life and healing, they must be accompanied by tangible actions that foster the full disclosure of the truth. Truth comes before reconciliation. He also says we will be fully transparent with our archives and records regarding all residential schools and strongly urge all other Catholic and government organizations to do the same. Our records regarding the Kamloops Indian Residential School to Kamloops Teshawampak were provided to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and will remain available for review. Because the schools were operated by both Protestant and Catholic churches and different uh, religious orders here in Canada, um, Different churches have uh, provided levels of apology and levels of redress that it varies a great deal. Yeah. Tricia Logan is the head of research and engagement at the Residential School History and Dialogue Centre at the University of British Columbia. The schools ran for 150 schools over 150 years. There isn't a very accurate number for the number of children who attended the schools, but of course that's that was part of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and also part of the, the stories that survivors tell today and told during the commission. Father Larry Lynn is an assistant pastor at a church in Port Coquitlam and spoke with City News on Monday on behalf of the Archdiocese. He said he stands by the work Archbishop Miller has done. He's been actively working to, to do the things that are being asked. And one of those things is to, like, to communicate to the, the people, to the congregation to his flock. City News asked the Archdiocese for another on-camera interview Wednesday and was declined but was told you might find it helpful to know that the Archbishop has apologized twice before in 2013 and in 2015. Even if the church cooperates completely, Logan says we will never likely get a fulsome picture of what happened and it's expected there will be Indigenous families that never find answers. Uh, is about unmarked burials but also missing children because it's it's for children who never returned home and that that means sometimes that the children passed away but it also means there are there is a significant number of children who just simply didn't return home to their communities in Vancouver Rhea Renouf City News 215 children. It's a number we will never forget and never should forget. People have gathered here at Grandview Park in East Vancouver today to remember those that we lost and were discovered at the Kamloops Residential School earlier last week. Now you have the ceremonial drumming that has begun and prayers will be done throughout the evening. Things really got underway about six o'clock tonight and they will continue for the next few hours. Hundreds of people are here. Obviously orange is the color to remember and honor those children. Many people bringing out their orange shirts with their young ones and elders. We spoke with many people here and they all seem to have some kind of a connection to residential schools. Here's what they had to say. And it's important to understand that there are more bodies, not just in that one site, but throughout all of the residential schools that have or have been taken down. 
Um, many of them have never been returned home. Today, I do feel scared. I do feel scared for our people because we are vulnerable. People now know what to say. But you know what? Hopefully, I pray that the world takes this and really understands where we came from. Like today, it's pretty sad and like you know, emotional. And it's pretty good to see all these people out here, you know, to support each other. One woman is offering free braids for children under the age of 12 here to honor all the children and so the importance of them in our world. We have drums and prayers throughout the night. We will be here throughout the show and speak with more people as we remember those 215 victims at the former Camp Loops Residential School. Some of the survivors talked about witnessing children being buried in large numbers into mass burial sites. The former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission sharing heart-wrenching testimony he heard from survivors. The discovery of 215 dead children at the Kamloops Residential School is confirming what many have long believed, and it's garnering international scrutiny. A warning, the details in this report may be disturbing to some viewers. The United Nations calling on Canada to perform an exhaustive investigation into uncovering the remains of residential school children buried in unmarked graves across the country. The news prompting retired Senator Murray Sinclair to retell the tragic stories he listened to while at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Some of the survivors talked about infants who were born to young girls at the residential schools who had been fathered by priests having those infants taken away from them and deliberately killed, sometimes by being thrown into furnaces. Nearly a week after the news from Kamloops broke, the United Nations, provinces and Indigenous leaders all demanding the government help fund the search of more victims. Ottawa releasing $27 million previously announced to fund the disturbing search. The estimated number of missing and well, of, of, of children that, that have, that died is underestimated. And so this is, there's going to be more of these. Sinclair believes there may be up to 6,000 dead children in unmarked graves across the country. And the pressure, not just on the feds. For years now, survivors have called on the Catholic Church and others to admit their role in residential schools and apologize. It's up to Catholics across this country to ask their church to do better, including not only whatever they have in terms of records that have not being shared, but particularly what we are hearing over the past weekend is the apology from the Pope. Bennett says communities will be receiving information today about how to access funds to begin searches. In Ottawa, Nigel Newlove, City News. So right now, vacationing families can park their RVs essentially on the graves of my ancestors. A Manitoba family is demanding their loved ones be honoured after their aunt and uncle were buried in unmarked graves in Manitoba, which is now home to a campsite. There are 194 new cases of COVID-19 across the province tonight, and four more people have died in the last day. 246 people are in hospital with 70 patients in the ICU. More than 3.3 million doses of vaccine have been administered in BC, and over 71% of all adults have now had a shot. Health Minister Adrian Dix says as a growing number of people are vaccinated each day, the province has no plans to bump up any dates in its restart plan. Our goal is to get as close to 100% as we possibly can to have the highest possible level of immunization. And we're continuing to push that that's happened. That's why we're uh, taking all of the measures we are in every part of the province to raise immunization. So 65% is a minimum. We've also passed, in terms of immunization, the 70% that was for step three. Uh, on July 1st in terms of immunizations, but we have to continue to see uh, cases decline. The next update from Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry is expected tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Ottawa knows people are getting irritated with the border closure with the U.S., but it says it won't give in to public pressure to reopen it. The Foreign Affairs Minister wouldn't divulge the criteria the feds are considering to nail down a reopening plan. The feds say it's being discussed with provincial leaders, but they're worried about reopening the border and then possibly dealing with a fourth wave of COVID. 
The Prime Minister has said it won't be seriously considered until the fall, when hopefully 75% of Canadians are fully vaccinated. Since the 25th of May, our bookings have been very positive. Hotels across the province are busy preparing for the eventual reopening of recreational travel across BC, which could happen as soon as June 15th. Just ahead, the challenges hotels have faced and the anticipation for the reopening. RCMP investigating another aggressive incident at a BC campsite, looking for the men pictured here. They're accused of threatening a family with a BB gun and a machete and demanding they leave. They were camping at the Chehalis Lake north of Harrison Mills a week ago Sunday. It was absolutely disgusting uh, and outrageous behavior and abuse, and nobody uh, should be uh, to subject to that. A similar situation that same weekend took place at a campsite near West Harrison Lake. But outdoor enthusiasts assure that serious conflict in camping is very rare. Or there's a very small number of bad apples that we don't want to ruin it for the rest of us, and so we just need some more enforcement. The minister says it's there and investigations are underway. We have hired uh, additional conservation officers uh, in this province. Uh, RCMP are also, you know, uh, on patrol in, uh, in, in areas around, right around the province, not just in communities, but in rural parts of British Columbia. Well, conflict is rare, more people heading into the outdoors and increased stress from the pandemic could jack up tensions especially as COVID rules at campsites will change. We anticipate this year that we're going to see a more freer, open type of behavior, and that in itself might lead to some frustrations. Have patience, and even though campers don't have to compete with international travelers, you're advised to plan ahead. Overflow will be for those people that are last minute and, and don't uh, uh, want to plan, but I would suggest this is the year to plan because unfortunately the, the demand is way in excess uh, uh, of what is available in supply. It's important that you understand that if you do want a spot that's going to be quiet and, and private and to yourself, especially right now, you're probably going to have to start a little earlier or drive a little further. And he says no, that everyone uses the backcountry differently. Some like absolute quiet, some like shooting sports and loud music. It's not fair for me to go to your spot uh, or the spot where you're set up and then say that I don't want to, to hear that noise. Um, so we just, just need to be a little understanding while it's so crowded and, and hopefully, hopefully things ease up a little in the future once the, the borders open again. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Usda. The man who hosted a series of parties at his downtown Vancouver condo is being sued. The provincial government is going after Mohamed Movasagi under proceeds of crime legislation. BC's Director of Civil Forfeiture says the $8,700 seized by Vancouver police during a bash January 31st should be handed over. It's believed the money came from illegal liquor sales. Mo Vasagi has already been fined thousands of dollars for breaking COVID public health orders. Thinking about a career change? Well, you're not alone. Why experts say employers need to get ready for what's being dubbed the great resignation to hit. And what we're forecasting over the course of the next 12 months is probably the hottest job market anyone in North America has seen in decades. We're just so excited. I think they're going to feel our energy. Hotels across the province are busy preparing for the eventual reopening of recreational travel across BC, which could happen as soon as June 15th, according to BC's restart plan. It's huge for us. We were tracking in March to have a really good April, May and beyond. And then when the circuit breaker happened, um, everything stopped. Right now, restrictions for non-essential travel between regions remain in place until at least June 15th. But the Times Square their Suites Hotel in downtown Vancouver is ready to welcome travelers from across the province as soon as it's allowed. What we expect is going to be our, our familiar guests. So the ones that are coming in from the island and from the Sunshine Coast and Prince George that know us and have been coming here for years. We had always had high standards, but now we're just making sure that we've got the extra touch points like little bottles of hand sanitizer. The British Columbia Hotel Association says hotels across the province are in desperate need of support. We're looking at occupancies in the Vancouver, Whistler, and Victoria uh, areas, uh, the lowest on record. So we have single-digit occupancy in all three of those jurisdictions. And uh, we also have different areas around the province, like the Caribou, the North, the Shuswap, some parts of the Kootenays, 
that really need BC residents to support them. But not all hotels are quite so excited for provincial travel. Erica Newlove with the Sunshine Lodge in Gibsons would like to see more vaccinations before travel throughout BC and to her small community is permitted. A little scary. Uh, most of my staff, all of my staff members, we have six on staff. They we've only been vaccinated once. So opening early is kind of putting us in a scary situation like at the beginning of the pandemic when we weren't even vaccinated. I would like to see it pushed back and I'd like to see more vaccine being done prior to opening. It's not just hotels longing for a return to normal. Brian McCutcheon with Rome Adventure Company in Invermere says travel restrictions have been devastating. Well, obviously it's been devastating. Uh, for us in particular, we deal with more of an international and U.S. based office uh, audience. So we've been, uh, we, our situation has not improved. But for those, uh, my colleagues who deal in a more domestic market, there's some good news in sight. But uh, we're really hoping to get the uh, borders open to foreign uh, travelers who have been both vaccinate, vaccinated and tested. But there's hope things will pick up for the summer. Since the 25th of May, our bookings have been very positive. And so we're not seeing the international bookings yet, but uh, we're seeing a good number of bookings from across Canada. So that shows optimism. In Vancouver, Miranda Fatour, City News. A 27-year-old man is dead after an early morning crash in Vancouver. Police say he was riding a motorcycle south on Canby Street near West 35th Avenue just before 2 o'clock when he somehow lost control and was thrown off the bike. Someone who happened to be nearby did first aid, but the motorcyclist was pronounced dead at the scene. Anyone with dash cam video from the area is asked to call police. And WorkSafe BC is making job sites more inclusive for people who wear religious head coverings. Starting September 1st, employers will have to review each area of a job site when determining if safety gear like hard hats are necessary. Up until now, many workplaces had a blanket rule about wearing hard hats at all times, and that led to members of the Sikh community not being able to fully participate in the workforce. BC's Labour Minister first requested his, this review in 2019. Housing sales across Metro Vancouver remained strong last month, but the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver says the market was calmer than its record-setting run in April. The board says sales in May were nearly 28% above the 10-year average for the month, but they were 13% lower than in April. The board's economist says the slip in intensity means sellers must work with agents to price properties based on current market conditions. A revised mortgage stress test, which cuts, which cuts maximum borrowing amounts by 4.5%, also took effect this month. The board will watch closely to see how that affects home sales. Netflix subscribers will be marking Canada Day with a federal tax on their monthly bills. The streaming giant has told its Canadian customers it will be adding GST or HST charges due to, quote, a recent change in Canada's tax law. The tax rate will vary by province and will show up on bills issued on or after July 1st. Netflix, not the only one. The higher taxes will affect all international streaming services available in Canada. That, after Ottawa unveiled plans last year to require foreign multinationals to collect GST or HST on digital products and services. The government says it's only fair since Canadian companies were already required to do so. So right now, vacationing families can park their RVs essentially on the graves of my ancestors. A Winnipeg woman whose family members died attending residential school in Manitoba is speaking out. Jennifer Ratray says her aunt and uncle are among the bodies of children buried in unmarked graves near a former residential school site that is now an RV park and campground. The indignity of having a campground in Brandon on my ancestors' graves, uh, even in death, these children who were stolen from their families and taken away and never came home, even in death, they're not at rest. Rat Ray says the grave sites are something First Nations families have known about for decades and in many cases were not believed. She believes it's an example of erasure, a way governments and churches try to distance themselves and erase what happened to more than 150,000 children over 100 years at residential schools. Brandon Mayor Rick Crest says the land where the graves were once located was owned by the city of Brandon. However, city council decided to sell it in 2001 to a private buyer after it was decided the land no 
longer suited the town's recreational needs. Everybody, you know, fully agrees that this has to be uh, resolved in a very uh, dignified manner to um, honor the children that are buried here. Rat Ray is hopeful the city of Brandon will buy back the land and consult with family members of deceased loved ones on how to move forward. However, she says the first step is getting back the land and allowing families to mourn on what is currently private property. Unfortunately, the discovery of lost, buried Indigenous children isn't unique to Manitoba, as recent discoveries in Kamloops, B.C. have uncovered another 215 children buried in around a different residential school. A joint press release from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC reads, the NCTR has so far documented 4,117 deaths of First Nations, Inuit and Métis children in residential schools across Canada. Former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner Murray Sinclair has estimated that 6,000 or more Indigenous children may have died due to abuse and neglect in residential schools. As for Rat Ray, she is optimistic for a positive resolution for all the families involved. I'm very, very hopeful that the right thing will happen now. Canada's better than this, Manitoba's better than this, and Brandon is better than this. We can fix this. In Winnipeg, Mark Neufeld, City News. We did lose some people during the pandemic. I, I think COVID's just got people reevaluating things a little bit, thinking about their path, their future, you know. Could we be on the verge of what's being called the Great Resignation? As employers and employees look ahead to what jobs will look like as COVID restrictions ease, experts say many workers may just pack up and leave. Many employers are underestimating how difficult this transition back to the office is going to be. Workplace expert Debbie Carew expects the return to the office post restrictions will bring one of the largest workplace turnovers of our lifetime. So if employers think that they're just going to say July 1st or September 1st, everyone back to the office, they're probably going to lose a third of their employees if they don't handle it carefully. It's this hidden thing that's about to hit employers that they don't recognize is coming. I think that most employers, when I hear them speaking in the news or they're putting out press releases, they're saying, our culture, our culture, our culture. And I think what they're, they're forgetting is that there's before March 2020 and the way the world was, and then there's after March 2020. And culture has evolved and change as people have worked from home. Most of the people we spoke to on the street were hopeful their employer would at least keep some kind of hybrid model with time divided between in-person and at-home work. I like having my own space, I figure out my own hours. I, I think having the chance to, you know, if it's just one of those days being able to stay home, mm. it's great. I love it. But you get that energy at the office still. The benefits from working from home, like the no commute and that sort of thing is is hard to pass up. Carew warns employers should start talking to their staff now about what they are hoping for as far as a permanent workplace environment. There's so many unknowns right now that a lot of people are really evaluating and saying, is the grass green or somewhere else? And even if they're not necessarily jumping today, I can guarantee you more than half of your workforce is at least thinking about it or looking at what other opportunities are out there. In Vancouver, Ashley Burr, City News. It's been another incredible summer-like day. Now we will see some slightly cooler air filtering in, the record high temperatures. Well, we still could see a few across eastern BC, southeastern BC, but that will come to an end as it cools down. And this flow of moisture, this jet stream that has moved well across northern BC, northern Alberta and Saskatchewan, it starts to moderate. It becomes more zonal, more west to east, starting tomorrow and then developing through the next couple of days. This wave of cloud cover, seeing some precipitation in there, we won't get the precipitation from that cloud, that trough line, but we will see some cloud across the lower mainland for tomorrow, especially in the morning. More sun breaking through in the afternoon. Still gets up to as warm as 25 degrees, especially away from the water. 21, maybe 22 along the coast. It's above average into Friday, too. It's a mix of sun and cloud. It's a dry day, 20 to 23 degrees, but things start to break down. A low tracks down the coast as we head into Saturday. I do have some periods of at least light rain on Saturday. Showers on Sunday, our shower risk on Monday, back to the sunshine by the middle of next week. But the temperatures are going to be more moderate, more seasonal, 17 to 19 degrees for daytime highs. That's a check on your forecast. 
As you can probably hear, drumming and singing have taken over this park in Grandview in Vancouver, honoring the 215 children discovered at the former Kamloops Residential School. You can feel the real connection among people here, and the crowds have just gotten larger, hundreds of people, and it continues to grow. There are some touching speakers, the message focused on keeping the story alive of these children and so many others. Food is being handed out, and a smudging ceremony will take place in a little while. So many people I spoke to here say they have some kind of trauma connected with the residential school system. I mean, it's important to understand that there are more bodies, not just in that one site, but throughout all of the residential schools that have or have been taken down. Um, many of them have never been returned home. Today, I do feel scared. I do feel scared for our people because we are vulnerable. People now know what to say. But you know what? Hopefully, I pray that the world takes this and really understands where we came from. Like today, it's pretty sad and like, you know, emotional. And it's pretty good to see all these people out here, you know, to support each other. There will be prayers, a smudging ceremony, and as you can see, people have really painted the park orange in honor of those 215 children found at that former residential school and many other children across Canada still to yet to be found. You know, there's a real connection among the community members here. Everybody's standing in solidarity. Masks are being worn for the most part, and you're asked to bring one if you have to be close with anyone else. We'll have this story tonight at 11. Thank you so much for watching City News Vancouver, and check out the radio News 1130 and City News Vancouver online for all your news updates. Have a good night and see you at 11.